Good morning, Kevill First Baptist Church. Glad to see you this morning. Hope everyone's had a good week. It's certainly a beautiful morning this morning with that sun shining. Helps, helps my attitude anyway. So, all right, I think we've had enough of these little gloomy days for, for a while. All right, if you would, let's look at our, our prayer our, our prayer bulletin this morning. Things that we have in there. Announcements, you've already received this week, we have a new calendar for the month of January. Things listed on there. Because now the WMU is not going to meet this month, and neither are the Jolly Elders. Uh, you notice on there reminding us of the, the blessing box. I know somebody has, has filled it. It looks very good this morning. So things that we're keeping up with there. A uh, new Bible study begins on the Wednesday nights on January the 13th. Uh, Brother Tim's doing one on false religions and cults. So sort of put that on your schedule. How many weeks will that go? Probably six to seven. I'm six not to really seven good. weeks. Okay, so yeah, put that in your... This is that time of year, you know, we've all got a brand new day timer. We've made that commitment. We're really going to keep up with things. So be sure to put that on your schedule. Six or seven weeks of January and February at 6 p.m. False religions and cults. All right, does anyone have any other announcements that we need this morning? Anything going on? All right, if not, let's look at our prayer list. Uh, of course, we'll continue to remember the Nickel family and the loss of Mike. Uh, friends and family, Bobby Earl and Ear. Seen Bobby Earl passed. It's one of those things, you know, no, he hadn't been in good health, but I just seen him a few days ago on the road. He thought, well, I just saw him. Well, it didn't happen that fast. So remember that family. Uh, they said Larry Brown has made an improvement. They've cut his oxygen back 50%, so he's doing better with the COVID. Anyone have any updates on any of these others that we have on our list here? I know Emily had went to Nashville this week for a chemo and had done well with it, but that's the level that she's taking. It's always three or four days after. It's kind of when it tends to get you, so I don't know how she's doing today. We hope the best for her. Tommy, what about Michael? How's he doing? He's, he's doing pretty well. Good. Really. Good. Sort of changed his kidneys. He had problems for a little bit. Good. All right. Of course, I want to remember Michael Dancy. He's been deployed. Of course, that's a, a fine, fine thing with the military. We don't know where. So, you know, that always continues. To, it, uh, un, uncertainty worries us more sometimes. So, but we uh, want to remember that family in our prayers. It's good to see Gail with us this morning. Says she had a good week. Anyone, do we have any additions to our prayer list? Uh, Earl Wayne, mm -hmm. you don't have to put it on the prayer list, but Shelly now has shingles. Shelly has shingles. Mm -hmm. Let her have shingles. Mm -hmm. Shelly Bass has the shingles. Okay. On the yeah, Jim. I talked to Amy mm -hmm. last night. Uh, Edie and um, Missy and her, and mm -hmm. she says that uh, they're doing okay. And, and uh, uh, Amy and uh, they're they're developing <laughs> symptoms from uh, from COVID, but but they're it's not bad. They're they're doing okay with it. Mm -hmm. They're just having to stay in and stay, you know, isolated and quarantined. Now, do they have these kitties staying with one of the girls, or is that a kitty at home? Yeah. And the girls are staying with them, so they're they're just quarantined there as kitties. Okay. So, uh, if you if you go to, to see about it, or just just set whatever you're going to set on the on the end of the sidewalk, they'll come out and get it. Don't go in. Okay. All right. All right. Kitty Burnley now has got symptoms of COVID. So. Do we have others? All right. If not, let's let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this week. Lord, we, we thank you for this time of year that we've been through. And so many things are overlooked due to this disease and the difference and the way things are having to be done differently. But you know, we have to stop and, and count our blessings sometimes. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to get together with just small groups of our family at a time and we actually get to visit with them more than, than we probably have in, in a long time. And we need to take from that and, and Lord, thank you for the blessings of, of, of the extra time. You know, we get so worried that we can't do it the way we've always done it. Well, it, it's a blessing to, to get, sometimes do it differently. 
Lord, we pray that we will be a more compassionate people and, and, and have a more loving heart and, and outreach to those in our community and those around us. And Lord, we know it's a hard time and a lot of people are, don't have work and a lot of people are, are sick or are afraid of the sickness. Lord, pray that you be with each and every one and calm them if they have their faith and belief in you. Lord, we pray for those that are delivering these vaccines that that process will move along very smoothly and many people can be vaccinated as soon as possible. Lord, we pray for our country, this time of turmoil that we're in, Lord, and we ask your blessings upon our leadership, whoever that may be. And Lord, that we will all move forward and that our country can, can become one nation under God again. Lord, lead and guide us as we go up on this hour and pray that you be with our pastor, Brother Tim, and thank you for him and his leadership and the word that you have laid upon his heart for this morning. Amen. You'll have to excuse me the way I walked Monday morning. I got up and walked into the bathroom and sat down for a minute. Next thing I know, something popped and I haven't been able to straighten up since. So we're going to worship together anyway. We're going to sing about the worship we give to our Lord and Savior. So let's all turn to hymn number 24. Hymn number 24, stand together as we sing the first, second, and final thing.
So, yeah. so tired you won't be able to breathe out of that night. 105. <laughs> Singing all the first time. Me and Michael come over here yesterday to make sure this tape would play. And yesterday it played. <coughs> so we're going to see if it plays this morning. <laughs> Stretched high to store the stockings and trim in the attic for another year. We were busily packing our Christmas away while singing a carol. When I heard my 
lives, people we knew, people we loved, jobs have been lost, businesses have shut down, and churches have been forced to close their doors. We've witnessed division on an unprecedented level, cities filled with violence, streets filled with protesters and we felt the sting of racism, the deep heartache of hate. There have been times where it's been difficult to see the hand of God. But even in the darkest of moments, He has been there, faithful, present, powerful. As a new year begins, we stand on a simple truth. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They'll soar on wings as eagles. They'll run and not grow weary. They'll walk and not grow faint. We don't know what this new year will hold, 
that we know that it's held by a God whose mercies are new every morning. This is what we place our trust. This is the truth on which we stand. This is our hope for the new year. Morning. Morning. You did it. You made it to 2021. Yeah. You're here. Yes. Yes. And it is it is good to see you this morning. And uh, it's good to be with you. It's good to, like Earl said, it's good to look through those doors and see the sun shining. It, uh, that makes me happy. So here we are, brand new year, and at the beginning of a new year, it's usually the same. I know it is for me, my thought process. Uh, we think of change, we think of new beginnings, but a lot of times we usually think purely physical terms like, I'm going to work out more, or maybe I'm going to read more, or maybe I'm going to eat better. Uh, I told the guys at work, I have uh, some, some uh, resolutions to increase my sodium intake and to drink more energy drinks. <laughs> the way I'm going to increase that sodium, I've already got figured out, John, more bacon. More bacon. And uh, I know that's probably not the healthiest, but you know, hey, it's realistic, right? Don't set, your goal, you know, set some high goals, but... Uh, but 2020 goes way beyond joining a gym or going on a diet, amen? Yeah. 2020 brought us a new set of challenges that we've never seen before. And I would say that it's probably safe to say that most of us are more than ready to tell the year 2020 to go kick rocks and bring on 2021. Woo, hello. And I'm sure you could, and I know I could. Personally, I could make a list of how 2020 affected my life personally. And I could say that this is the worst year ever, but I'm not sure that that would be a true statement for me. I took a hit in many areas. Um, I lost every event from the middle of March through April that I booked. And uh, I know this is not the reason why I do it, but, but I lost a lot of income from those events. I took a hit there. I had uh, family that tested positive and sick from COVID. My, my oldest sister back in March and April was sick and, and my own son had tested positive and, and, and was sick with COVID. And in 2020, I lost one of the best friends and the mentors that I ever had to COVID. but I must praise God for his faithfulness. He has provided me with a job and kept me working every day this year. He has protected me and Sherry so far. Why, I don't know, but his grace and mercy has been on our home. And I praise him for that. He, he brought us together. As a family, he, he has put us together. He has called me here to be your pastor. And I praise him for that. And there's so many things that I could be thankful for in 2020. But the truth is, none of us could have predicted the events or the happenings of 2020. When we begin a new year, we have this hope and this expectation that the new year is going to be better. It's time to change things. It's time to redo those missed opportunities. But the truth is, is no one can predict what this year holds. And there's no guarantee that 2021 will be better. And you're thinking, well, that's really uplifting and <laughs> optimistic. Things could be better. You know, church, things could be worse. We, we don't know that. We, we don't know that for sure because the reality is this. This world is broken. 
And it is getting closer and closer to the return of Jesus. And if you read the scripture, listen, things get bad before Jesus returns. And we just took another step, another year that he's given. But we just took another step closer to his return. You can make every resolution possible to take better care of yourself, lose weight, eat better, exercise more, spend less money, eat more bacon. What, but what about your spiritual needs? We often neglect those. We can slim down, we can exercise more, we can eat better, we can do all the right things and still die in our sins because we neglect the most important thing, which is Jesus. You see, our hope should not be in a new year, but our hope should be in the one that makes all things new. The greatest change we can ever experience is being made new in Christ. We are born in sin and we need a savior. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. No good deed, no work of our flesh will bring us restoration with God. It's a free gift in Christ. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, it offers us a chance to be born again, to be made new in the Spirit. So the next few weeks, we're going back to Bible Basics 101. And we're going to look at how we can be made a new creature in Christ. We're going to look at salvation, sanctification, and repentance. And this morning, we're going to look at salvation. And we're going to look at a very, very familiar verse, John 3, 16. I know I've preached from that verse here before, and, and, and I know you, like me, have heard sermons on John 3, 16. You've probably heard more powerful and impactful sermons that, that I have preached and, or what you're going to hear from me this morning. But I want you to do something for me this morning. I want you to act like you've never heard this verse before. Like you just like stepped onto this planet and you're clueless about what's going on. You have no Bible knowledge. You've never been to church. And I want you to imagine and to act like you've never heard this verse before. I want you to imagine that this is the first time anyone has shared this passage with you. Hear it for the first time this morning. Hear it new. Hear it fresh. If, if you're saved, you get it, you understand it. But, but here, refresh your mind and let it soak in again what it means to you and your salvation. And if you're lost, this verse is a summary of the whole of the scripture. It is the source of new life. It is the source of eternal life. F.F. F. Bruce says this, if there's one sentence more than another which sums up the message of the fourth gospel, it is this. The love of God is limitless. It embraces all mankind. No sacrifice was too great to bring its unmeasured intensity home to men and women. The best that God had to give, he gave his only son, his well-beloved. I also kind of borrowed this from a commentary uh, written on John 3.16 by a guy named David Guzik. It's on the blueletterbible.org. If you like a good study, free resource, bluebible.org is a great one. Uh, I use it a lot. It's, it's really easy to use. and it, it actually is a chart. He calls the seven wonders of John 3.16. And they are this. Number one, the almighty author, God. The mightiest motive, so loved the world. The greatest gift that he gave his only begotten son. The widest welcome that whoever, the easiest escape believes in him. The divine deliverance should not perish and the priceless possession but have everlasting life. If you have your Bibles this morning, if you would turn to John's gospel, the third chapter and the 16th verse. I know you've got it memorized, but hey, this is the first time you've ever heard it before. So if you open it up and let's look at the words on the page. I'd also like to read uh, the following verses after it, a few of those as well. 
but we're going to focus on the 16th verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son to the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen his works have been carried out in God. Would you pray with me this morning? Father God, we thank you so much for this day. Father, I thank you for those that are here this morning. And Father, those who are watching online, God, I, I thank you for them. They're precious. And Father, as we look at probably one of the most familiar passages of Scripture that there is, especially for those that have been in church for any period of time, God, make it come alive and make it come fresh and new to us. May we see how impactful, how important, how, how incredible this passage of Scripture is to us and what it means in our lives. And it's, it's not just a saving verse, but Father, it is a life verse for us to carry out every day that you give us. Father, thank you for this verse. Because it brings hope. It brings hope to the hopeless. It, it brings, it, it gives us an opportunity, Father, to, to, uh, to have a new life. To be made right with you. Father, thank you for this morning, just for the opportunity to gather. Thank you for the sunshine. Thank you for the opportunity to sing praises to you this morning, to see songs to you, God, to, to just to be in your house with, with brothers and sisters in Christ, Father. Another opportunity, God. May we make the most of it. We love you and we praise you. It is in the precious name of Jesus I pray. Well, if you have your outline, it's in the bulletin. I know you're going to be impressed by the outline because I, I put together it this morning. It's, it's hard. It's a hard outline. Give y'all a minute to look at it. I worked hard on that outline. Landon was like, yes, easy type. I put that in the bulletin. See, I told you, we're starting new beginnings, right? Mm -hmm. Let's look at number one. Number one is simply this, God. God, for God so loved. Well, let's look at that word. Well, God is the all-powerful creator and sustainer of the universe. He is, he is personal. He is not a distant force. God thinks and wills and feels. God loves and God hates. And you might be thinking, hey, hey, wait on, wait a minute. Yes, I said that. Yes, he hates. And people have a problem with saying God hates, but he hates sin. God hates evil. Proverbs 6.16 6, actually lists seven things that God hates. It's that God hates haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, Feet that make haste to run to evil. A false witness who pours out lies and one who sows discord among brothers. If you look at the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments speak to the things that he hates. He hates it when people bow to any other God than him. He hates it when we worship graven images. He hates it when his name is used in vain. He hates it when we dishonor our father and mother. He hates murder. He hates adultery. He hates coveting. He hates stealing. He hates lying. See, it's part of him being holy. 
If he didn't hate evil and things attached to evilness, he wouldn't be holy. It's because of his hatred for evil that we even have this verse. Because he hates sin and he loved us, he did something about it. But, but God is personal. He is moral. That means he deals with us in terms of right and wrong and, and good and bad. You see, church, 2020 and 2021, it doesn't matter what year it is. It doesn't matter what era it is. It doesn't matter what decade it is. It doesn't matter what the styles or the fads are. God has not changed. His standards have not changed. There is an absolute truth and the things that he has condemned as wrong, he still condemns them as wrong. And because God is moral, he is steady in his righteousness. He doesn't waver. He only does what is right. And the infinite worth of what he defines is what is right. To do right is to think and to feel and to act in a way that is in the harmony with God's infinite worth. You see, all of us were made by God. And our first and our highest duty and our main reason for existing is to honor him and to give him thanks. We were created. Our, our, our biggest priority is to give God glory and to bring glory to God. But here's the rub of all of that. We have all failed. And we are all under his righteous displeasure and we are all subject to his divine wrath. This is what makes John 3.16 so needed. And this is what makes it so precious. It describes the way God is acting to rescue us from our sinful, hopeless condition. But when we look at this verse, when we read this verse, really when we read all the verses, this passage is about God and not us. When we read God loved the world so much, we can be guilty of thinking that it's about us. And when we make it about ourselves, the focus, it makes God's motivation for sacrificing his son as if he simply could do not, do not, excuse me, if he could simply could not do without us and that he would do anything to get us back. When we, when we make us the focus, we think, oh, you know, God's up there wringing his hands. What am I going to do without them? What, what am I going to do without them? I'll do anything to get them back. And, and that's not right. This ideal, this ideal that it's us has, has crept into contemporary, this contemporary Christian movement that focuses on a me-centered Christianity than a, rather than a God-centered one. There's this popular worship song, and it's actually a, a beautiful, beautiful song. And, and I love this song, except it includes this one line, which is wrong. It says, you didn't want heaven without us, so Jesus, you brought heaven down. The biggest problem with this idea, it's, it's not in the Bible. What's more, it completely reverses the truth of the gospel. It wasn't our worth that brought Jesus to dwell among us. Rather, his coming down brought us our worth. You see, Jesus makes us worthy. We were lost. God didn't look at us and say, oh, they're worthy. I can't live without them. So I'm just going to say, Jesus, you just go down there because I can't do without them. <clears throat> His coming down brought us our worth. Our worth is found in Christ. And the difference here, it's not a small thing, especially in our adulterous uh, culture of self-love. One of the greatest lies is that God needs us and, and he doesn't. The ideal is at the heart of all false religion. God doesn't depend on us and he needs nothing from his creation. Acts 17, 24 through 25 tells us that God is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. You see, the key to understanding that it's not about us, it's about God, is found in the little word, so. That little word. The little words, we kind of, they're important in the scripture. Sometimes we're like, we, we pass them up. For God so loved. 
The, the Greek word so translated in English means thus or in this manner. So if we read it, in this manner, God loved the world. Our attention rightly focuses on God. In this manner, God loved the world. It is in this manner. This is how God loved the world in this manner. It reveals to us something about God and the nature of his love, namely that is entirely boundless, selfless, and gracious. You see, it's not because he needed us that God loved us this way. It's quite the reverse. It's because we desperately need him. Number two is world. For God so loved the world. The most common meaning for world in John is the created and fallen totality of mankind. The Greek word is cosmos. It's where we get our word cosmos and cosmic and cosmetics. John also writes in chapter 7, verse 7, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because if I testify about it, that its works are evil. And in John 14, 17, he says, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. It is in this way that that's how John is using the word world. It is the ungodly multitude that is alienated from God and is hostile to the cause of Christ. It is this great mass of fallen humanity that needs salvation. It's the countless number of lost people that are the whoever's in the second part of the verse. That whoever believes in him should not perish. As John Piper puts it, the world is the great ocean of perishing sinners from whom the whoever comes. Number three is gave. For God so loved the world that he gave. There are two important things about this giving. One, this giving came from heaven. And the other is that giving didn't just come to earth to hang out, but he came to die for the sins of the world. If you read the next verse, and we read the next verse, in verse 17, John replaces the word give with sin. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So the giving of verse 16 is God sending his son into the world on a mission from heaven. And in John 10 Verses 17 through 18, we see what the climax of that mission from the Father is. Jesus says, for this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. You see, the reason that God sent his son was so that the son would lay down his life. I lay it down on my own accord. This charge I have received from my father. So when John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave, the giving is God sending his son to earth on a mission to die. Think about that. It's this incredible, amazing concept that's really hard to even wrap your brain around. God says to his one and only son, son, there's something I want you to do for me. I have some enemies that deserve to die because of their rebellion towards me. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to go and to die in their place so that they can have eternal life. Think about that. Think of Think of how just, listen, you know, you know son, I, I've, asked, I've asked my kids, I'm like, hey, i got a favor. Would you do something for me? I, it, sometimes it's, it's a simple thing. It's like, you know, they live out of town, and, and it's like, like Tanner, you, you, know, you know Tanner, and a lot of you do, and it's like, son, could you just do me this little favor? When you get home, I know you're a man, but when you get home, could you just please text me to let me know you got home safe? You know, could you do me a favor? Could you, you know, if, if you're not busy, could, could you, you know, you want to go get something to eat or could you, you could do this or would you mind helping me clean up, you know, the yard or whatever? Son, 
I've got these enemies. There's a whole world of, of rebellious, stubborn people that are my enemies. Would you mind just going there and die in their place? Take my wrath, pour it out upon you so that they can have eternal life. Think about that. Hey, it's unreal. And Jesus was obedient. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. God gave us so much more than we deserve. He gave us the very best he had. He gave us his son, number four. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. This word describes both the expression and the gift of God's love. Now, your translation may say only begotten. Um, the phrase only begotten it has been used by false teachers and cults to say that Jesus was literally begotten, that, that he, uh, he was actually physically born, that he was uh, not with God in the beginning. And they say if Jesus was begotten, then he is a created being, therefore he cannot be God. Well, only begotten in John 3, 16 does not mean Jesus was somehow born or created by God the Father. It has nothing to do with procreation like some false religions teach because that word begotten is used in other places in the scripture to mean that. But it comes down to the original language. That's how our English translates it to, to begotten. Well, the word that John uses here is monogenes, M-O-N-O-G-E-N-E-S. And it means being the only one of its kind or class, unique in its kind. And in its simplest form, it means unique. John's main concern was to demonstrate that Jesus is the Son of God. That was his point here. That is why he specifically uses the word monogenes, to highlight Jesus as uniquely God's son, sharing the same divine nature as God, as opposed to believers who are God's sons and daughters by adoption, Jesus is God's one and only son. Jesus was declared to be son of God by the prophets. He was declared to be the son of God by the angels. He was declared to be the son of God by God the Father. He was declared to be the son of God by himself. His disciples declared him to be the son of God. His enemies in Matthew 27, 54 declared him to be the son of God. And by the power of his resurrection from the dead, that declared him to be the son of God. You see, God's love didn't just have sympathy for the struggle of a fallen world. God did something about it. And he gave us the most precious thing that he could give his one and only son, Jesus. Number five is believe. Number five is believe. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes. Well, let's look at the word believe. I have A, B, C, and D in my notes. Letter A. Jesus dying for the world is not universal or automatic. Not everyone will benefit from what Jesus came to do. But whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Not everyone will believe. Many will reject and those that reject Jesus will perish and not have eternal life. Letter B, the word believe, it means to embrace something as true. And when it's a person, it means to trust them to be what they are and to do what they say. Letter C, in John 1, 11 through 12, John uses the word receive to explain believe. Jesus came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So receiving Jesus and believing Jesus explain each other. Letter D, if we receive him, we are to receive him for what he is. 
In John 6, 35, Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. So here, believing means coming to Jesus and receiving him as food and drink that satisfies our soul. This is why faith is so transforming is that we believe in him. Number six is perish. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish. What is most clear and most important is to see that perish is the alternative to eternal life. They shall not perish but have eternal life. So if you perish, you don't get eternal life. Verse 18 describes perishing as being condemned. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. What this means, it means that the, the God's judgment of wrath is on us as sinners and it remains on us. And we see this in John 3, 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So we are already under condemnation because of sin and unbelief. And perishing means staying there forever under God's wrath. And there's nothing worse that you could ever imagine than having holy God oppose you with righteous wrath forever. That's what perishing means. And then number seven is life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. This does not simply mean that you exist forever. Everybody exists forever but not everybody has eternal life. The life that John is writing about is about being born again and having a spiritual life. Remember John 3.16, it's a whole conversation that was started with Nicodemus. And Jesus starts this whole thing out. It says, unless a man's born again, you will not enter in the kingdom of heaven. And Nicodemus is perplexed by that. Well, how can a man enter his mother's womb a second time? Nicodemus was a smart, well-educated man who knew the scripture, who knew the law, had been taught since he was a little boy. He's trying to figure this out in the physical. And Jesus like, it's not about physical. It's, a, it's about a spiritual rebirth. And, and Jesus is telling Nicodemus, listen, we're all, everybody is, 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 is sin, you know, in sin. They're all separated uh, from God. They're all under God's wrath. And, and the only way that you're going to enter into the kingdom of heaven, the only way is through a spiritual rebirth. By believing in the only son of God. And that's what he's talking about, this eternal life with him. John is writing about being born again, having a spiritual life. And we know from John 6, 63, that it is the Spirit who gives life. And we know from 1 John 5, 11, that this life is in God's Son. This is life to God. Life that can see and savor God is glorious in all His creation, the way it meant to be enjoyed. Listen, the only way that anybody, I see that anybody can got through like 2020 is, is being a child of God. It's the only way that I got through it. It's because my hope, it was having, having life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He had, gives us eternal life, but he also gives us life that is full and abundant now, even in the worst of conditions. So what happens when we believing in Jesus is the Holy Spirit is uniting us to Christ in whom is life. And in that instant, we are born again. We believe we are united with the Son of God and we have his life. And because it is the life of the Son of God, it lasts forever. I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus said, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Folks, when I take my last breath, I'm out of here. I don't die. I'm just changing neighborhoods. I'm out of here. I'm living forever. 
Those in Christ, that, that's it. Everyone who lives and believes in Jesus shall never die. Jesus gives life. God gave us Jesus who came to die in our place. By dying in our place, he took on the wrath of God so we don't perish under that wrath. Jesus was the Lamb of God, the sacrifice given in our place. He is the one who bears our sin and our punishment. You know, the scripture says it pleased the Father to crush him. And, and that's something I can't get my brain around either. But it was necessary for us in order to be saved. It's what brought God the glory. It's what gave us a chance to have a new life. So we have eternal life both because Christ died in our place and because in him is life. He removed the great obstacle of God's wrath and he supplies the everlasting life that we don't have in ourselves. So this morning, as we finish up, if we're gonna have a time of invitation and if, if you would just go ahead and stand with me this morning. This morning, right now, right in this moment, do you live in the forgiveness in life and in the freedom of John 3.16? Right now, this morning, do you live in the forgiveness in the life and the freedom of John 3.16? Because there is great freedom in this verse. Are you free from the fear of death? Do you fear death? Knowing what this verse means and how it speaks of God's love, how does it shape your relationships? This morning, are you giving lip service to this verse? Or do you live it? Is this your life? This morning, if you're here, and you uh, are lost.